गुड इवनिंग एंड अ वेरी वॉम वेलकम टू ईच एंड एवरी वन हेयर आई ज्योति कपूर एहसास वुमेन ऑफ नागपुर वेलकम यू ऑल टू नदर सेशन ऑफ द राइट सर्कल एन इनिशिएटिव ऑफ प्रभा खेतान फाउंडेशन प्रेजेंटेड बाय श्री सीमेंट लिमिटेड इस्टैब्लिश्ड बाय डॉक्टर प्रभा खेतान प्रभा खेतान फाउंडेशन प्रोवाइड्स प्लेटफॉर्म्स टू केयर गिवर्स committed individuals and like minded institutions to implement cultural educational literary and social welfare projects in india the pandemic has not been able to deter the foundation's noble cause prabha ketan foundation continued with the various online and offline sessions to keep up the spirits of its patrons we have lokmat as our media partners Radisson Blue as our venue partners the right circle strive to bring together authors and their readers in an informal and engaging setting the sessions are structured around the life and works of the author followed by an interaction with the audience the right circle started its journey from jaipur and now has sessions across india and even overseas in oxford Birmingham, New York and Oslo. Today we have with us Ms. Shriana Bhattacharya, trained in development economics at Delhi University and Harvard University. Since 2014, in her role as a senior economist at the World Bank, she has focused on issues related to social policy and jobs. Prior to this she worked on research projects with the center for policy research ilo seva union and institute of social studies trust her writing has appeared in the indian express the hindustan times epw indian quarterly and the caravan she lives in new delhi her first book of non fiction desperately seeking sharukh India's lonely young women and the search for intimacy and independence was published by Harper Collins India in November 2021 the book has recently won the scotch prize for the best policy book at the 79th indian economic forum held in march 2022 Shreyana also uh, Shreyana shall also be receiving the Fikki Ladies Organization's Young Achievers Prize for Literature on March 29th 2022 many many congratulations for this Shreyana in conversation with her is Miss Monica Bhagwagar Ehsas women from Nagpur now i request the all the audience to please sit back relax and enjoy the conversation may i request monica to please escort our author today lord we begin shrayana shrayana no, no it's shrayana actually shrayana. so yeah. that's why what does it mean <laughs> what does it mean yeah uh, it uh, my grandfather told me it means someone you can depend upon so the root is sharan i think but usually i don't know why off late it's always sharanya which is i think why everyone thought it was sharanya but my grandfather had a you know hatke mazaz ke the so he decided that uh, it would be shrayana but it means someone you can depend upon and it's rooted on shelter so here we go shrayana okay. so this is my personal pleasure and delight to be having this conversation with you today you're very special to me because You're the first one after the pandemic that I have the pleasure of interviewing. So thank you for being with us. Thank you and for inviting me. And a very, very me. warm welcome to the Orange City. Thank you so much. This is such a pleasure for me as well. It's still exotic, I think, to see people in a room. <laughs> <laughs> because you know i remember i had my launch and even there when i saw people this was in bangalore and then we had the next set of waves so it's really special and it's my first time in nagpur and everyone's been very very kind and very nice so thank we you we deserve an applause huh. really i will be back for sure <laughs> thanks okay so uh, off we go since we have lots of questions uh, because you're young vibrant it's great to see you so the first question would be that you don't look what you are <laughs> you are you are a senior economist at the World Bank a technocrat and a bureaucrat yeah 
and now an author. So what's your story here? Uh, my story is that everywhere I've been, I, I'm always the misfit. <laughs> so um, I had never thought that I would be, in fact, an economist, you know, in, in the technocracy of the World Bank. But I actually really love my job and I love studying economics. I had originally thought that I would be an academic, but somehow that that world of sitting and only lecturing, I wanted to really get my hands dirty in a way, you know, to, to be in, in working closely with government, actually seeing how these decisions when it comes to the economy are made. And it's been a privilege and honor, in fact, in my job that I've been able to do that. But then even with that, um, there was a part of me that never really felt completely spiritually satisfied. I think all of us have this, right? We have jobs and then we have passions and I love to write. I love to read. I thought I was writing diary entry notes. Mm -hmm. So no one in my family had even thought that there was a writer in the, the these notes. And um, I think I started writing, in fact, even more so as my career as a bureaucrat, technocrat grew because, you know, in my day job at the World Bank or with anyone who works in government as well will know this, there's a language, right, that we use to write. It's very planes, there's a very clear sense of what the language will be. Uh, it has its own creativity, but it's not particularly creative. And I wanted an outlet. Mm -hmm. And I was see, I think I was experiencing a lot through the research projects that I was working on through my own life as an economist. And I wanted to keep a record of it somewhere. And then writing happened as a record. And now I'm honestly, I'm the most surprised <laughs> more than anyone else. If anyone had said to me 15 years ago when I was going off to study that uh, I would have this book and uh, it would look the way it does and it is what it is, I'd say get out of here. But I think uh, I, I, it's funny how if you follow your passions, it's strange where life will take you. How everything's positive. Yeah. So uh, at the very outset, I myself am extremely passionate about Shah Rukh Khan. Oh, very good. A <laughs> lot of people. <laughs> yeah, actually, I think we should have a poll here. Who likes him? Yeah, no. I want to. All the women, how many men? One, two, only two guys. No, the poll should be around the way around. How many don't like him? Yeah. Don't, how, how many don't yeah, like him? Huh? Yeah, yeah. Okay, one, two. Oh, that's yeah. Very brave people, actually, these <laughs> women are most brave, I have to say. Because when I tell them I love Shah Rukh Khan, oh, he's a ham actor and he's a sissy oh. and they're like, oh, no, he's gorgeous. Yeah. Yeah. But they're wives, particularly just because they're wives. So you must, this book, has, this, that's why this book is a bestseller. I think to irritate the husbands, <laughs> all the wives have been buying the book. <laughs> that we'll do later. So, uh, economical and social status has been widely touched upon in your book. Yeah. So how does the most intriguing name of Shah Rukh Khan come about in your book? Yeah. And that, to add on <clears throat> that, desperately seeking. Yeah, I am. Uh, <laughs> but that's a different story. You know, let me start by telling you, I think for those who don't know, the book is born out of a set of accidents. Uh, it was 2006. I was in my early 20s. I was quite young and very foolish and I had just been trained in development economics and you know in economics they teach you how to do a survey, right? So you take a questionnaire, you go to the field, you go and ask people questions. I was sent, I was working for a feminist think tank called the Institute of Social Studies Trust. Uh, it was a project with this union which is actually one of the largest union of women workers in the world. It's called SEVA, I think yeah, many of us here know. And uh, I was sent to a low-income neighborhood in Ahmedabad called Bapunagar. It was my first field site, as it were. And I showed up very enthusiastic with my questionnaire, all ready to capture all this quantitative data. And my enthusiasm met the complete boredom of the women I was supposed to interview. These women were home-based garment workers and home-based agarbatti makers. They were earning about a quarter of minimum wage. So really struggling, but working very hard. I think 10 rupees uh, for Eight, per thousand. Yes, that's right. 10 rupees for per thousand agarbattis. Agarbattis that you roll back then and now it's become 15. So in 15 years, it's only gone from 10 to 15. But I think that will come to in a second. And, and when I started talking to them and asking these questions, they said, look, we know the answers to these questions about our wages, working conditions. We've already had surveys done by other girls wearing khadi with kajal in their eyes. Like this is very boring for us. So can we talk about something else? And you know, the one thing I don't want is I don't want anyone to be bored of anything I have to say. So if you're bored, you should raise your hand right now. 
And I then said, well, let's take a break. And in the book, I call it a research recess. They teach you this in social science. You take a break, you use icebreakers, you talk about other things. And in our country, it's either politics, it's cricket, or it's Bollywood, right? Across the, and I'm not particularly interested uh, in cricket. Uh, politics, I didn't want to discuss. And I thought, well, Bollywood is it. I'm a big Shah Rukh fan. I started asking women who were their favorite actors. And from the slums of Ahmedabad to the villages of Uttar Pradesh, to the forests of Jharkhand, everywhere I went, in between 2006 to 2007, I just met all these women in very different class circumstances, different occupations, religions, caste, but they just loved him. And I realized I was sort of almost, almost by accident, I'd created this sort of invisible fan club of women who'll never meet each other. They met me. And then I decided that I wanted to follow up on why they like Mr. Khan. And one of the things I realized is that actually when they were talking about Mr. Khan, they were never talking about him. They were talking about themselves. Uh, because what they were doing is anytime they talk about, and it'll happen right now if I start to talk to any of you about your favorite actor, you won't be talking about him. You'll start telling me about where you were when you watched that movie, what he means to you, and in particular for the women from the emerging middle classes and working class communities, they were all telling me about how hard they had to work just to be able to watch a film on their own. Um, and which is why this is very much a work of economics, a uh, blurb by an economist du jour. Um, because I wanted to tell a story about women's access to purchasing power, women's access to an independent income, and funnily, in Mr. Khan, I actually, you know, the book is not about him. He's my research method in the book. Because I realized when I asked these women about Shah Rukh, they started talking about the men in their families, what was happening in their families, their love lives, their jobs, the fact that it was so hard for them to watch a film. A statistic that should really startle us is six out of 10 people in a cinema hall are men. Um, and, and there are more statistics in the book about how constrained economically women in our country continue to be. Um, and so by complete accident, uh, all conversation on Shah Rukh ended up being a conversation about media, markets, and men. I had not expected it. But then the one thing I did do, which I did fairly thoroughly, is that I followed up. So from 2006 then till 2019, 20, it's 15 years, I followed these women. So every year, Shah Rukh would have a release, we'd chat. Um, and invariably it was about their lives and the book is essentially a story of their lives. Um, it's a story of not just the women from the working classes, but I also met women from my own class group, other groups, and it's a, it's a fan club. But they're not just fans of Shah Rukh, they're fans of their own independence, which is why it's the search for independence. Yeah, but you've hit the jackpot by, the, just the, by virtue of the title as well, that Shah Rukh Khan yeah. desperately seeing women. So that comes to my next question that uh, Lonely women and Shah Rukh, how do you perceive this? Because uh, I'm going to be hitting 57 this year and I've been talking to women of all age groups and I'm very sad to say that uh, a lot of women are facing loneliness yeah. in their marriages at a young age as well. So uh, you'd like to throw some light on that? Yeah, um, the subtitle of the book. In fact, I think the book is about the loneliness of Indian women. And I think there are three reasons why this is happening. And I will have to apologize to the men in the audience if this offends them, but I don't mean to, but I have to just, you know, I have to tell you what I learned, which is I think we have a very serious crisis of masculinity. And, and the crisis is not, and I don't mean to say men are bad or that's just boring. I mean, I'm not interested in saying things like that. I think what I mean to say is there's a kind of emotional labor that women are performing when it comes to following up on other people's needs, keeping track of what people need. There's a labor of love. Loving is a lot of work. Uh, for anyone who says that, you know, we have a low employment rate, I always laugh at them. And I discuss this in the book. In fact, all women in India are working because they're constantly working on the job of love. Marriage is a job, motherhood is a job. All these jobs are just so complex. Um, and men's capacity, and this is not just true of Indian men, I think this is, this is a crisis we're seeing globally. As women have almost become liberated economically, there is an expectation now of a man who will also do the same share of emotional labor. And I think that expectation has shifted. So I see this in the 15 years that I followed these women. There's a big shift generationally because the mothers will say, well, 
I'm willing to adjust, I'm willing to compromise. But the younger women who I was talking to, they just, they were not. They expected men to show up exactly the way they expected them to. They expected men to treat them a certain way. So I think part of the loneliness is a crisis in the masculine. Yeah, because it's also not, it's not just lack of sexual intimacy. It's also lack of emotional yes, intimacy. Yes, exactly. There's no connect. And I see this happening a lot around me these days. Not just Nagpur per se, Nagpur, but all over the yeah. country you're meeting women. All over. It's very sad. And I do not know who's failing who. Is the man failing the woman or is the other way around is both together? I, I think it's both together. Uh, one of the things I, I end the book with this discussion of what has happened to love. Mm -hmm. Economists often don't talk about love. I've dared to talk about love in book and economics. And I think I have Mr. Shah Rukh Khan to thank for that. Mm -hmm. um, but you know what, 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 it, what has happened is two things. I think we have a generation of women also who somehow feel at least the women in my book maybe this is not true for the women here I don't want to generalize but certainly they feel very unconfident expressing their needs so they may have needs of men um, needs of their immediate emotional environment first they can't articulate it Sex, so for example they'll keep saying oh I wanted I want a man like Shah Rukh, right and I kept asking them like what does that mean because you can't none of these women are silly they're not chasing a celebrity it is as a, there's a kind of masculinity that he's portraying that these women desperately want in their life. So I kept asking them, what is it? And it was as simple as he just listens to me. He shows up in the kitchen. You know, suddenly his imagery allowed them to be a bit more crystal clear about what those needs are. But we really have a generation of women who are not able, and even if they feel it, they won't say it because there's a lot of fear around what will the family think, what will happen. There are what economists call hidden taxes. That's so that's one. We are conditioned. Absolutely. We are conditioned not Absolutely. to have our individual desires emotionally or otherwise. And we don't have the confidence to even put it across because probably we're shy that the man will take it amiss or whatever. Yeah. It's and, weird. Yeah, no. And, and the other issue, which I think where is men, is that uh, we need to now just be forcing men to do housework. I, I know it sounds, uh, I, I really, yeah, I really feel like the, we are, I, I, I agree, I know, I know, tell them, go Actually, tell them. she asked me a question that I hope some men are coming. Yeah, I told her, I said, I really hope. Hundred percent, hundred percent. I'll come back and then we'll have a full session with everyone. But you know, the, but the, the, I'll tell you why. Because India right now ranks. There's actually data on this. We rank in the bottom five of the world when it comes to the share of men helping in housework, and we are in the bottom five with Pakistan, Syria, South Korea, um, and you know this. It, it's a it's a very worrying state of affairs. So I feel it's sort of the jugalbandi of both men and women. Um, so I think women, much like how everyone here is, you know, very clearly vociferous and speaking up, I think that that we require and then we require men to just show up in more in the kitchen like Shah Rukh does in his movies. You know, the thing is that we should start teaching our children like my daughter. She, I'm constantly battling with her now because all she says that you moms are such stereotypes like it is there. I'll be honest. Like, I do tell my daughter to pick up the plate more often from the table than my son. So I guess we have to start yeah. ourselves first. Husband ki tabhi bit gayi. <laughs> no, no, I, I, no, I think it's never too late, but irrespective. Uh, but I will say one thing, all the studies show, and I mentioned this in the book, all studies show by economists, sociologists, that women who are much more out and about, you don't need to be holding a job in the sort of formal sense of the job sense, but even women who are leaders, politically, culturally, whatever they're doing, if they step out of the home and they have an identity divorced from just mothering and being, you know, at the home, their sons invariably grow up as far more progressive because they see the women in the house. Uh, there's a lot of, you know, you see, you know, <laughs> women are not just breathing for your service. Uh, with, and I think that's a really important side. So even, I mean, of course, you should nudge. But I think even the fact that so many women now are really out and about wanting yeah, to carve an identity, it helps. That, exactly my point. I see more women trying to carve an identity for themselves, even if they're not doing that per se, but even if they're wives of businessmen, they want to have yeah. their own some sort of a presence, you know, and that arises again out of a need, some sort of a need to go away from loneliness. I feel that I may be wrong, but come to the next question. Um, this book of yours has taken as I understand, 15 long years yeah. to write. Gosh. Yeah. yeah. Um, my perception is that at, when you were writing this, at every age, you must have a sort of uh, in different ages and different phases of your life. 
So then, uh, how does it influence your writing? Because as an author, you need some sort of a continuity. And here you're doing a lot of data jargon yeah. as well. So because what you must have been going through your personal life, how did that impress your writing? So uh, as you probably know, Monica, um, as a good feminist text, I am in the book. Uh, there's a story about um, a very terrible love affair I was involved in, which is in there. And I'm very That's grateful. It is, yeah, all of it is nonfiction. Um, and I'm actually very grateful to the gentleman because he, he gave me permission to write about it because you can't write about people without no, letting them know. That's unethical. Um, but the, and actually we're very good friends now. So anytime I have a Delhi event, he'll show up. But the, the, the thing that I was going to say is that um, you're absolutely right. Till 2013-14, when I was sort of still, I think it, I was just about to hit my early 30s, I had thought that this book was very academic. I mean, I was doing these interviews every year and I was going to write it in a very, very scholarly way. There's a way I think scholars write. And then in 2013-14, I had this particular love affair. And it really, I think, changed something in me. You know, you, life happens and you, you change perspective. At what age? Sorry. I was, I think, 32. I was probably 32, 31. So you're later. mature enough at that point of time. Yeah, to, okay. I hope so. Uh, <laughs> anyway, and uh, and uh, although I'll, I'll let you all read the book and tell me what you think of my levels of maturity. But the, the thing that was interesting was at that time, I just realized I wanted to shift the way I, write, I was writing. I wanted to make it much more personal. And so I went back. I mean, I was anyway continuing to interview the women that I was doing. But I went back and I completely redid the text. And so what you see here is a much more accessible way, I think, of writing as opposed to writing it as a very academic piece. Um, I also let go of a lot of the jargon and preconceived notions I had of feminism. Because, you know, when you're young, you just read stuff and then you believe everything you've read. And I'll give you an example, like this gentleman who I was seeing and I, you know, he's in there, he, he comes from a Rajput community and many of the women I met through his family you know, very covered up, um, very perfect. There's a lot of labor in just being physically and emotionally perfect. And I initially judged all these women based on all this feminist text, right? That, oh, they don't work and they don't do this and they don't. But I got to know some of them. And one of them actually, she's in the book as well. Uh, someone I, I later ended up becoming very close to. And I realized a lot of my preconceived notions about these women's lives were so wrong. And so I think in a way it was vision correction for me. And I'm grateful for that. Had I written the book before that, I think it would have been a very childish text. That's really my sense. A very sort of, you know, rah, rah, rah feminist without being, I think, what I now call dal sabzi feminism, you know, like much more grounded, much more real. Um, so yeah, I think, I think my own life shows up in the book and I think my own experiences then just shaped the way I was thinking. Um, and at that time I decided I wanted to no longer make this book about, oh, poor women and me. I wanted to open it up to women of my own class group, middle class women, elite women. And I went and did many more interviews. It's been a long journey, but I've enjoyed every bit of it. Um, I have no... Yeah, because we love your work, it shows in your yeah. book. So yeah, great. Now this book, friends, has done commercially fantastically. So that's really great. Thank you. Applause, applause. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, did you really expect this, that ah. uh, it would be a runaway success? No. Uh, <laughs> no. I, uh, I expected a lot of people initially, which I think has happened. You know, initially when you see Shah Rukh in the title, there are some people who are loyal fans, so then they're interested, but then they won't necessarily pick up a 500-page book because, you know, if you're a fan, then you can watch Shah Rukh. Why read a book about him? I mean, that makes no sense. Um, so I had already known, I think the economist and me knew that just because it has him on the title doesn't mean it'll convert to sales. Um, so I didn't expect it, but I have to say, I think the reviews and particularly women's responses across the board, women journalists, just, you know, today someone in Voice of Fashion has just reviewed the book, like women in very different spaces. It got featured in the BBC and it's been everywhere. That's been really overwhelming and I think that's when things really picked up. So I had never expected it. I really hadn't. I wrote it because I really wanted to tell the story, but I had no expectations. And, uh, you know, everything else is gravy, as they say. You did say just now about these young women. So that's my next question that I understand that mostly it is the young women who have related a lot to your book, right? So how does that relate? I mean, why such a, the younger generation is finding your book so fascinating? So actually, it's, it's mixed. I mean, my sense is that so I went to Delhi University recently and I realized a lot of women who are studying undergraduate, you know, they're like in their early, late, early 20s, 
women in their 20s and 30s certainly i think two reasons one is i think everyone wants to sort of understand why is it their feelings of loneliness are being shaped by society the economy and i think everyone wants to feel less lonely and i think many people turn to books to also feel like this is an experience that is not just mine but other people share as well so i think that's one um i think the other thing is uh, i don't think many of us yet know that women who are out and about of the home particularly those who are studying working we are such a meager minority in our country and the book has a lot of data on that and i know that that's really opened a lot of young women's eyes because i think once you realize you're part of a minority you start to realize why the loneliness the feelings because you are lonely because you're a statistical minority of course you're going to feel lonely you're so small it's a group um so i think partly is just that and then the third is i feel anytime anyone is open about their own personal experiences which i have been and other people's personal experiences it resonates right because it's not fiction i think people feel like i've been there i've seen it um so that's that. but you know another group i have to tell you uh, it's it's young women but also a lot of the journalists and you know people now who are reviewing it i can see a shift it's sort of now women in up, uh, older age brackets who i think are now hearing more about the book often through their daughters which is interesting i've met many people who said to me for example the mother may not read english so the daughter has sat and like explained to her what's happening in the book she really wants the mother to know and i've heard a lot of these stories um hopefully the book will be translated soon and it's a lot of now uh, i think yeah it's it's women who read but i really want men to read it i feel like you know as i think lady here was saying that you know there's no point just women reading it and then it resonates your experience that's great but i really would like more men to read it and let's hope that happens i don't know i mean um i've been wondering is what it, why is our section of women uh being lonely at different ages of their lives every sector has women who are actually lonely lonely what is it that our men can't handle confident young smart educated <laughs> women where are, there are men around so what it, and it's not just the loneliness regarding just the guy 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 yeah yeah right it's loneliness amongst the family members as well there's no connect between uh, say the parents and the child so Yeah I I think actually finally I I really believe Manmohan Singh is to blame for this. It's a very I, I'll explain why. You know when the economy opened up and it really opened up in the 90s we are all children of those set of economic reforms we were children of liberalization. Shah Rukh Khan is a child of liberalization. I think what's happened is the distinction between me and my grandmother has just grown so many folds right because my exposure to media as someone who was born into the telecom boom that mr singh's reforms and those reforms set up then sustained by the later governments as well just essentially means that i have nothing in common with so many of my own family members right whereas if i look at my mother um there was still i think that distance between her and her own mother was smaller because they still had you know the like for example often so many women in my book will tell me i am the first woman in my family to have friends because usually the friends were cousins relatives you know the lives you led were largely within the family um and i think so finally actually i think this has a lot to do with economy and i think because women's then expectations have really boomed with that sort of big media more exposure and yet in your immediate life you're not seeing that being mirrored or met of course you'll be lonely because i think is this complete sorry how is my mohan response because i think we wouldn't have telecom without those reforms right <laughs> the satellite i mean star tv shahrukh khan i mean all of that happened because the budget opened up telecom had telecom not happened we would be a very different generation we would be doordarshan yeah, india yeah that's true that's true i mean at my age i also feel technically challenged when my kids are on their uh, exactly this knows i feel yeah. like i'm from another generation so there's another set of reforms i i think the economy and this is actually one thing i really want to highlight and i think the book is trying to argue this which is so many of our feeling states right like feeling lonely lost unloved the economy has very serious i mean it can shape those feelings and uh, that's why i say it's mr singh's fault <laughs> okay so um <laughs> I'm sorry I'm going to be targeting the men but <laughs> we are delighted to have you here no wait so I, please don't take it yeah, no 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 in fact I want to say one thing which is that actually in the book there are so many cases of men supporting sisters wives so again I started from the beginning I think it's actually boring to sort of just say oh it's all men and I I don't believe that the reason in fact I call this book desperately seeking sharok many of my like very lefty feminist friends have said to me 
why is a book about women why do you have a man in the title it's because we can't progress without the two and so yeah i i, I agree i don't think we're targeting men we're just saying change <laughs> they just have very simple change. smiles on their faces change <laughs> change a bit yeah no I, i'm not I, I, sorry no choice yeah because you know generally i too feel that men should also change their women have moved leaps and bounds ahead yeah. i mean i'm not talking just physically the women are better turned out by men today <laughs> no are they the men which are i think are so busy trying to earn that extra you know earn the money they sort of sort of neglect themselves or whatever but the women have sort of groomed themselves they work harder on themselves in terms of getting intellectual being up with the things happening around it's evident in the parties the women are talking the men are hanging at the bar they don't know anything <laughs> is better they don't know anything better oh i'm happy to i guess yeah that's true this is what that happens every me. party i am I, i i it's not that i want to be that old world charm where the man opens the door for you and asks you for a dance or offer you a drink but common kuch to karenge kuch bhi nahi and nagpur guys is not only nagpur it's everywhere you to but today, you know, that's wait, the way i mean i will tell you something though <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, yeah, you really hit a nerve, which is that uh, one of the funniest things. Yeah, sorry, one of the funniest things that I saw that was happening in the book is everywhere I went and I interviewed women, they kept saying, "We want men like Shah Rukh, but our men are like Salman." You know, and I think, I think what you just, what you just said is like that's exactly what it is. Which is that, although I think you know, I, I, I actually, I, I think that's you know, I mean, we can, we can discuss Salman Khan another day, but the point is that. I I do think that there is this gap, and again, I will go back to liberalisation. I really think with Sarv Shiksha Abhiyan, and this is not just true by the way of our class group. If you read the book, you realise expectations have boomed in the slums of Ahmedabad, villages of Uttar Pradesh. Young girls are just not willing to put up with the fact that their brothers, men, are on bikes driving up to highways and going to malls, and the girls have to stay at home. They also don't like the way the boys dress. they don't like so many things and you know honestly had it not been for the fact and there's a story there in the book about a young woman who runs away from her family uh, from her husband's family because she just wants to experience noida she leaves from from uh, western uttar pradesh she moves to noida starts working in a garment factory she eventually i won't give it away uh, she when she does have to go back but you'll have to read the book to understand what happens she said to me later when i followed up with her and it was actually very difficult to find her because for a while i'd lost touch with her because the family didn't know where she was and you'll read the book to know what happens but when i did find her she said you know honestly had had life been safe for a woman to live on her own had there been safety law and order i would have never returned yeah exactly and i think that's what's happening increasingly i think we have this generation of young women first generation in these areas to study to step out of the home because of tv again mr singh's fault because of tv because of you know even before the mobile phone remember because i'm following these women even before the mobile phone really exploded this is 2006 it wasn't everywhere all these women are looking to not just sharok they're seeing london they're seeing the way sharok reacts with kajol and they're thinking what is this life here i want to experience something else you know i don't maybe i don't want to go to london i want to go to a mall in noida and uh, I think these are actually very potent shifts, and I think boys are really struggling. And this is why I have a lot of empathy actually for men in this culture. I know you don't. I do, which is that I think it's very hard. You have a generation of women who just completely changed. You know, liberalisation has liberalised women's desires, and men aren't able to adapt yet. Because as I said, the women have evolved. The men yeah. haven't. Lagging. <laughs> That's the sad part. I'm. Okay, we're going off the topic because this is a very touchy topic with me. Because at any party when the conversation is happening or any other forum when you're talking about this conversation, it is generally a sad fact. I'm not saying we love our men; we need them. We'll always need them. I'm not saying that they're. <laughs> But I generally feel that our men definitely need to evolve intellectually, also emotionally, also, and they need to be more sensitive towards their women. towards their daughters to yeah their i agree with you and i'm not talking about our class you know we just think like a, you know in a time yeah. that with our class no our class also is suffering which is worse because we are smart enough to understand what's going on we are intelligent enough to see the uh, pitfalls that was happening in the relationship but we can't do it about but you know monica i'll tell you one thing which is and you'll see it in the book in fact i actually think where women have just said i've had enough and i'm exiting 
is actually working class communities. Whereas it's actually women of our class who are really struggling to exit. And I'll explain why. I think in many of these, like the slums and villages that I was visiting, it's become very clear that men's jobs have also become very insecure. So it's not like a man can actually provide you, you know, the, the role, the traditional male breadwinner role, which is by the way also why I have some additional empathy because it's, it's, it's a struggle because men are taught to believe that your role is the breadwinner, right? Now, if jobs are insecure, you're not able to earn enough. Uh, many of the women are saying, why should I stick with this kind of arrangement? And you'll see it in the book, you know, these women who exit out of marriages, there's a single woman, a woman whose husband initially abandons her. She just says, I'm not going back to you. I'm going to live on my own. I'm going to manage on my own. Um, whereas I think it's in our class group where, um, yes, there are divorces. One hears this. And I should say, in fact, if you look at the latest data, the employment rate for divorced women is 67.5%. The employment rate for married women of our class, which is the top 20%, is 6.5%. Yes. You just see the, you see the gap, right? And what that actually is saying to you is that we also have a generation of women who have also been socialized. So many women would say to me, well, I wouldn't be comfortable if my husband were to just say, I would like to be at home and be a caregiver. Many men may enjoy that. Maybe men don't want to be in jobs that are, you know, horrible. Women may want to be out and about. And I think there is this kind of dynamic between the genders. And I'm hopeful, I think, as long as the two speak. Right now, men don't speak as much. So they're like Salman. If they spoke, they'd be like Shara. Yeah. <laughs> but um, I don't know where I heard you somewhere. I forget the name. That very uh, well-spoken gentleman, his name began with V. Amit Varma. No. Some other name. Where you, he, he tried, you have, you have been very explicit. Sorry. You've been very... <laughs> Uh -huh. I love how this has now just become like a you know, like a, a, a party. <laughs> very much trying to get in touch with Shah Rukh Khan. So have you managed? Yeah, no, I have. Uh, as we speak, uh, the book is definitely with him. Um, and nice. uh, we will hopefully, we'll see. But to be honest, um, I'll be through. I mean, I know that he has the book. Uh, people in his team, they have the book. But honestly, for me, given I think what I just said for the past half an hour, 40 minutes, I'd love it if he'd say something about the book, but to be honest, in a way, the book is the absence of him because it's him as an idea. It's not him, the star. Um, and but someone because asked, you love him, it'll be nice. I, it'll be okay. Uh, but you know, someone asked me recently, I did an interview for Mint and they asked me, well, did you ever consider interviewing him? And I said, yeah, if I went to interview him, I'd faint. You know, I'd do something stupid and I don't want to. So I, I've just kept a significant distance from him and myself. Uh, but uh, yeah, we'll see. So getting off the book a wee bit, your credentials are so many and so high flying over my no, head. No, no, no. I just want to understand what do you do? Okay. Uh, <laughs> Besides being an yeah, author. Yeah. So uh, how many people here know the World Bank? Uh, okay. So, so typically the World Bank largely provides loans and support to state governments and even national governments in different areas, could be energy, could be infrastructure. I work on social protection and labor. So for example, I lead right now a project with the state government in West Bengal. There's one in Kerala, another in Odisha. Uh, we're developing something in Maharashtra, where essentially we will be helping the state improve its delivery of welfare programs. Uh, these are direct benefit transfers. These are different kinds of mechanisms. Um, you would have seen today with the election news, there's been a lot of conversation about welfare schemes and these have really boomed in India. So I focus on studying welfare. I look at insurance programs, Narega, the public distribution system. I study those. And then I study the jobs landscape. So I know the data on employment uh, because governments then, so government ask us for, they ask for advice, they ask for inputs. So mostly they listen, not, and then they listen. Uh, but I actually have to say that uh, I think my next book will be on bureaucrats because I spent a lot of time with them. That's actually what, because most of my work is with them. And uh, they're very, I, I have a lot of, uh, I've learned a lot from them. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'll tell you one funny story, and I know we're, we're running out of time, but no, I have no. to, I have a very funny story about a bureaucrat who, who now is a very dear friend of mine. He came from a very conservative family IS officer and this was early days in my career at the bank and I was going in and he was sort of senior in the government of Chhattisgarh at that time, he comes from that cadre. And I, I went, no, this, no, no, I can't, I can't. And uh, it was, it was really remarkable. I used to go in and initially he would never look at me, you know, so I'd be speaking and he'd look at my male colleague 
to say, okay, so could you say and things? And I used to get really angry and I thought, what is this nonsense? And I remember my boss at that time said to me, do you want to just move to another project because this is really uncomfortable? And I said, no, because I realized I just need to show up and deal with it. Because if you're going to work in India, you have to put up with these things and then you have to sort of see where it goes. And he was always very respectful. He just respectfully ignored me, that's all. <laughs> and, uh, and finally, actually, uh, I kept showing up with, you know, so we do these presentations, we have surveys on the ground, so on and so forth. It took a year and a half and then eventually just shifted. And uh, he suddenly, now, now we're friends. And then he told me three years later, that actually he comes from a very conservative family where they are taught not to look at women. And he's never seen a woman, you know, prior to him being in training as an officer, he had never really dealt with them. But now being in, a, in the bureaucracy, he's dealing with a lot of women who have dynamic roles, very, you know, leadership positions. And so for him as well, as much as for me, it was a change. Mm -hmm. And now we're friends. So nice. that's a, that gives you, I hope that answers what I do. <laughs> <laughs> So do we have time for me or would like to shift to question answers as well now? Hmm? We have five minutes. So now that you want to, you want to share something more? About the book? Yeah, about five minutes more you have. Um, why don't I uh, tell you a bit about the women in the book just so that you have a sense of who's in it? Does, is that interesting or? Yeah. Or yeah? Yes. Yeah? Yes. Yes. Um, so it starts with, so the book is divided in four sections um, and the sections map out to where these women are in our wealth spectrum. So the first part starts with people like, well, many of us here, elite English speaking with lots of opportunities, tend to be typically upper caste as well. Um, that's where you meet my story, the Rajput philosophers and all the people I was describing. Um, there's a young woman there called Vidya, who calls herself Vidya. She's an IIT IIM product and also went to an Ivy League. She loves Shah Rukh not just because she thinks he's, you know, so cute and all of that. But to her, he is very much a sign of social mobility. You know, a man who came from middle class Delhi and then really made it without networks, without any of that. And she feels that in her immediate milieu, she comes from the salaried classes and she has friends who come from more network classes. You know, parents are Jim Khanna club members and so on. Her parents are not. And I think it's really interesting, it's, it, it sort of speaks to this changing composition of Delhi because you have lots of migrants coming and she's migrant into Delhi. So you meet people like that in the first half, the first part of the book. You meet me and my interesting story, I hope. Um, shifting to the second part, it's the emerging middle class. So typically these are girls who, the, who are the first in their families to study, uh, to finish school, to hold a job, and I call them bazigars in the book. It's actually that's what the part, the section is called, because they've gambled away the security of family. Because both of them choose, one of them chooses to become a bureaucrat and not marry. Um, and I met her. I was privileged enough to meet her through my own work. I used to work at the Delhi Secretariat. That's where I met her, and it's her story. Um, and she said to hell with all this arranged marriage business. I, she said, I cleared government exams. Why should I clear marriage exams? And I'm happy the way I am. She marries for love, but she just hasn't found anyone she loves. Um, and you also meet a young woman who ran away from her home in Rajasthan to become an in-flight attendant in Delhi. Um, and she has a very interesting life where she ends up dating a Frenchman and then all kinds of things happen. So, you know, as I said, this is liberalization, right? Like people's desires and the mating market liberalized. So that's the second part. The third part is actually Sorry, the, mating market the mating, yeah, the mating market liberalized for in, in Gurgaon. <laughs> Only in, I think, in, in, in Gurgaon. Yeah, and, and there's a particular shape to that, which you'll have to read the book to understand. And the third part of the book goes to the women I started with in 2006. Uh, this is the precariat, uh, the young woman who was young when I met her and is middle-aged now, much like myself. Um, and she is an Agarbati Muika in a low-income neighborhood in Ahmedabad and her and her daughter. Their favorite film is Dil to Pagal Hai and you have to read the book to understand what happens to the two of them. Um, single mother-daughter duo. There's a domestic worker who migrates from Jharkhand to uh, Delhi. So you meet women like that. Uh, one story from that section that I would like everyone to know is this young woman, Lily, who's the, she's a tribal Christian domestic worker, moved from Jharkhand to Delhi, works for an expat. Uh, she told me that if everyone looked at a tiffin the way Shah Rukh looks at a tiffin in a film called Rabne Banadi Jori, if you haven't seen it, you must see it. Please see it. 
uh, she says then all women's lives would be better. So this is really interesting. Huh? This is a woman who is paid for care labor and she's making this association. And I think this goes back to what you were saying about men changing and appreciating. Um, and the fourth, which is where I close, is in a way a summary. Uh, that's where I get a bit more technical. I interview a bunch of activists and scholars on what they think about the stories I've captured over 15 years because these women's lives have changed. Um, and it ends outside Mannat because I used to spend a lot of time outside Mannat interviewing people who used to come because I was very curious about why they were there. And you'll have to read the book to understand. Um, and, and the last story I will say, and I'll close with this, is that there's a gentleman who sells water outside Mannat because it's a big tourist spot. And uh, he looked at me once and he just, you know, he'd seen me multiple times showing up for interviews. And he looked at me and he said, but madam, ab bahar kya kare? Ab andar <laughs> your sir is inside. What are you doing outside interviewing all of us? And I think that's pretty much the, the, the thrust of my book, which is actually, I'm not interested in telling you a story about Mr. Khan. I mean, journalists have done that. Mr. Khan himself has done that. I'm interested in telling you a story about the women who love him and what that love tells us about women themselves. Thank nice. you. So when I was asked to host this talk, I was told that, you know, Monica, you love her. She's just like you, hmm. vibrant, very, very easy to talk to, very, very easy to listen to, and you've done it. So oh, thank, thank you, you so much. Thank it's been you. a pleasure. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much for a such for such a wonderful, interesting conversation. Now that you all know who Shreyana Bhattacharya is and the inside of the books, the stories about uh, the ladies who are in the book, the Bazigar, and everyone. So I am sure you must be having a lot of questions with you. So we are inviting questions from the audience. Whosoever wants to ask a question can please raise your hand. So hi Shrayana, this is Meghna. Uh, you have based your book on Shah Rukh's uh, life and but he's a movie star and these are movies, they are dreams they are selling. Uh, so uh, all these women are looking at a dream, not a reality. Yeah. So how do you see uh, them getting something which is not real? No, in fact, reality, we only dwell on fantasy when our reality disappoints us. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, it is a very sorry state. In fact, that's actually why I think the fantasies that Mr. Khan sells us are so appealing because the reality of gender in our country is so grim. And I think that's that's actually, I actually say in the book that his extraordinary icon is completely built. You know, in economics, they teach you demand and supply, right? This is the demand and yeah, supply. So yeah. Is it a bit too much to ask uh, from the world which is real? But I don't think something any of these women, unreal. no, I started by saying, and I will keep checking anyone who suggests this, they are not silly women chasing a celebrity. You read the book and you'll know. I'm not a silly woman chasing a celebrity. I think all these women are so tired and exhausted in their everyday lives. Describing, I think Monica said, this constantly expecting people to change, watching yourself, how am I wearing, how am I holding, all of that. They're so tired that this is fun. It's escape, it's entertainment. I don't think any of them is expecting a Shah Rukh in their real life. They may want certain characteristics of him in their sons. They may want sons who grow up to be, and you'll see like this woman said, you want to appreciate the tiffin, all of that. And I think, in fact, it's quite remarkable, right? Because when we talk about celebrities, we often think of them as some sort of, you know, seductive person personalities. We've all been seduced into sort of thinking they're so great. Actually, you realize in the book, all these women are constructing Shah Rukh. None of us know him, but each one of the women in the book, they've picked bits and pieces. Because remember, his iconography Excuse is not me. just love. Yeah. It's like stalker, toxic. There's a lot of nonsense going on in a lot of his films as well. And many of the women will say, I don't like it when he does things like that, but I like when he's like kind and courteous and listens to people. Yeah. And it really makes me sad. You know, there's a review recently of the book that just came out and actually said this, I think it was in the BBC and they said that it's a very sad telling that if you're looking to an actor because your reality is so grim, grim. it's a very, we don't realize that when we think about him, right? Um, and so, yeah, but I hear you. I know what you're trying to say, but I think that's exactly the point that it's not real. Thank you so much for your answer. Thank you. But his son has to take appointment to meet him. Maybe. He <laughs> wouldn't know. I wouldn't yeah. know. I hate statement. Yeah, maybe. So, yeah. I think what uh, your book yes, is about. Why, why you make so much celebrity idol 
no no that's a book about mostly i think if you would have uh, been down south probably desperately seeking mamuti desperately Mamuti. Seeking mamuti. Yeah. yeah so it's desperately seeking <laughs> yeah. leisure or freedom yeah, than shahrukh exactly. yeah, that exactly. the book is aiming exactly. and nothing yeah. to do with the celebrity Uh, hi, I'm Dr. Ravi Varakade. I am into genetic health and uh, mind transplant. Hi. So, I think this book is about mental health. Yeah, that too. It is actually about mental health because, uh, see, this is a, a real position what you are trying to explain. The society has so many expectations, yes. especially talking about women. Yeah. There are so many expectations and men are busy somewhere else yeah. trying to struggle, yeah. trying to have bread and butter yeah. and whatever their aims and ambitions are. But now the life for men are also tough. Yes. So somewhere there is a big gap. I completely. But women are trying to fulfill their dreams. Yeah. And men are completely away from it. Yeah. Working on the ground, maybe below the ground, or in on their reality, own dreams, yeah. or in their own uh, different yeah. kind of dreams. So this gap needs to be filled. I completely agree. Yeah. And uh, yeah. yeah, this gap needs agree. to be filled. There is no nothing like. And I really, I'm really glad that you put all the blame of all this thing happening on Manmohan Singh. <laughs> so on men are saved. <laughs> <laughs> so it is not about <laughs> feminism it is more about liberalization it is about the economy but yeah. then something hit my heart is that this is about mental health i agree with you I this needs to be completely and i'm glad you are in world bank and world bank is doing a lot of work for Thank mental you. health and uh, all kind of things so i just loved the concept and the Thank way it is sir. put because sharukh khan is something which is a catchy title yeah and then talking about the reality going inside every heart and mind yeah. that's something wonderful you have done thank so you thank so you for much, this sir. piece thank of work thank, thank you thank you and i thank think it's also much. more about how to uh, men should be empowered to you know to handle the empowered women <laughs> yeah. there is a there is yes, a gap that's there that's very well put yeah uh let i'm actually uh, working since 27 years now in the area of mental health and i i pretty, pretty much agree with all the beautiful ladies here that men are finding it difficult yeah. to accept these kind of yes. women yeah. but then is it that they don't want to no it's not like that yeah they need to be more, probably they need to be more educated I agree. they need to come to these kind of forums more often i completely agree with you we completely we need to you. yeah definitely for you yes yes Completely agree, yeah, and completely we agree we need to bring Sharanya more often here. Yeah, of so course. this we kind of course. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And uh, actually, I continue to talk about how women are difficultly placed. Yeah. And uh, there are so many expectations from women, and yeah. I really respect women for the the multitasking they does and very efficiently. Men are not so multitasking; they feel challenges. So when yeah. they are doing four tasks. it is for as like they are doing 10 tasks yeah and when women is doing four it is just like doing one yeah. so even women need to understand that men have different kind of challenges yeah as well as men need to uh, completely understand how women are having dreamy kind of a challenges yeah wonderful yeah. thank you thank so you. much thank you. next question please hi shriyana hi i am nandita and i'm a psychologist i deal with uh, children i'm working in a school a uh, small incident i'll share before i'll ask my question uh, something which you just said hit me uh, at home i am a great sharukh fan my husband like everybody else hates him completely <laughs> and my son uh, i have a one son who is caught between both of us you know uh, so he would always my my husband would say what rubbish he's such a big nose and he looks so horrible and i would be all over and i would tell him you know why i like sharuk it's the way he makes the lady feel like you yeah. said something how he looks yeah. at the tiffin yeah. i said it's the way he looks you feel he is genuinely interested yeah. in you he ignores everything else around you that's his yeah. thing which i like you know and uh, my question is do you think um, the young male generation can actually benefit from this book i think they are at an age yeah. where they really want to change like how we said there is a huge I, gap yeah, I and i think the ones who are in their 20s or just getting their young uh, boys or the young men yeah. can actually benefit from your book and maybe they should be more of the readers than the women I completely agree uh, and I hope that all of you who have 20 year old sons please take a extra copy of the book and give it to them um and uh, no I I I fully agree with you yeah and I I think it's it's time that uh, I 
actually one thing i will say to you it's been really interesting to see young men's response to the book so that i have been interacting with a lot of young students of late so some really get it from a perspective of oh, i want to understand women so maybe this book has something to teach me right and it's interesting others there's this like very macho kind of dismissal on like sharo ki kitab hai why are you like what is so thing and so on but then i think increasingly i've also noticed that uh, they get judged then for the dismissal and then they react but i fully agree and thank you for saying what you did but actually just following up to what she had said that the way he makes you feel just a way quick uh, yeah uh, say for sonu sood being a nagpur boy is a good friend a dear friend of ours so he was in dubai uh, before the pandemic uh, having a new year party with him i think that woman rani picture was released whatever that whole group happy of new year that's right so they were so when we called the wish him he said yeah uh, happy new year blah blah i said is sharukh khan with you in the party he said yes i said can i talk to him <laughs> and lo behold it was sharukh oh my god khan i'm so jealous <laughs> and i'll tell you hi monica how are you and how are you doing where are you parting are you doing something interesting with your life blah 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 he chatted with me as if i was just next door and Aww. i know him from donkey so that is what you know he struck a chord with you at a very personal level and i was sold for life so let the men take a walk sharu wow. yeah. was so yeah that's it but you know it's it's it is actually one thing i will say to you is one of the things that i notice every woman in and this is again going back to mr singh i will keep bringing him back <laughs> um which is that you know one of the things that happened when there was a telecom boom is that suddenly you had sony tv and all these different channels star tv and all and they needed content to fill up space time and they started using his interviews every woman in my book it doesn't matter if you are like educated poor they have seen those interviews they may not have fully understood it but they see the way he behaves and it's interesting what you just said you had a personal experience of a phone call but so many young women would say to me that oh did you see the way he was with his wife or did you see the way they were in the interviews and actually prior to that no actor had access to telecom that way right even mr rajesh khanna or mr amitabh bachchan these are all phenomenal stars but they weren't able to like enter our lives at that time that the same yeah. way because suddenly you had all this telecom so yeah but i'm very jealous of you and maybe i won't speak to you after this monica so so that's so beautiful it's like you know getting sharukh khan's few of his elements whom uh, you know we connect very well yeah. with we want those elements with the male figures what we have yes. around with us yes. maybe a brother father boyfriend husband whoever it is yeah. those elements the which are missing the ladies basically are craving for those elements it's not the celebrity shahrukh khan they want in their lives yes, it's those saying, personality yeah. traits what we are looking for which we think are missing and the missing is the the thing which is the gap between the empowered women and the disempowered men i would say <laughs> okay, we have a man as we want some no it's it's you know you with due respect to all the men you must come with the book what women want that that is actually what i wrote sir <laughs> we have a man <laughs> right who asked us a question right please go ahead hi i am akshit i'm 20 year old kid and i'm an engineering student i have a question that uh, many of my female friends tell that we need freedom in our life hmm. like uh, i have a best friend like i'm very playful with her like just let's just imagine i'm sharuk of uh, her life <laughs> charming playful and uh, kind of like my grooming is done by the ethics the rules and the regulation of scene of sharuk khan as a man hmm So the girls talked about freedom that they need freedom in their life. Yeah. So what does the freedom means? Yeah. If they need space or what do they need? Yeah, that's a great question. Um I, my sense in the book is I heard that word a lot. In fact, in fact in the book when I say desperately seeking Sharuk Sharuk's almost a metaphor for freedom. I think there are three forms of freedom that at least the women I followed and I won't generalize I'm just going to talk about the women I followed in the book. one is economic freedom mm. to be able to earn your own money and not be made to feel bad about it and you know it's amazing particularly in the north of the country we still live in a culture where when women are stepping out and working there's so much gossip there's so much chick chick that yeah, sure. that freedom to just be able to do the work and then have a man who will also help you out with those decisions right and that you're not the only one who's working all day then coming home and taking care of everything so the one is economic freedom where i think men should step into the kitchen and help them and not judge women for their careerist ambitions and not judge them if they want to stay at home either i mean those are choices right that's one i think the second freedom is sexual freedom we still now live in a, and this goes back to the mating market particularly the north and this is true of metropolitan india men occupy a far more open market for desire 
And that is because fundamentally co concerns about contraception, concerns about reproduction, men don't have to be worried about them. There are stories of that in the book and they're quite frightening because what you realize is all these young girls, they have to handle their own sexual and emotional hygiene all on their own. Men will just disappear, right? So I think there's a problem there of women feeling like men should also behave with some hygiene in the way they approach the mating market, right? That if you're exploring options, you should do it as you just said, ethically, right? Um, I think the third freedom, which is very difficult, and I think all of us deal with this, and I think men deal with this as well. Economists call these hidden taxes. Um, what we mean is anytime people start to do things that there's a certain social structure that is not used to them doing or doesn't like them doing, right? So a man deciding to stay at home, for instance, or a woman deciding she wants to, you know, uh, dance openly. I'm just using that as an example. You'll see stories in the book where, you know, how taxes are. These are not taxes in cash, but these are taxes in bad feelings, in making people feel bad about themselves. And I think so many of the women in my book, when they say freedom, they just don't want to be constantly having to hustle and negotiate for love. They, sh they want to just be loved for the choices that they're making. And I think those are the three really important freedoms that, ha that are very critical, you know, to the, at least the women. I'll add to that uh, also the freedom they're looking at of their own choices, of their own career, of their own yeah. mate, the marriage uh, fact, that is not happening. Yeah, so. And probably safety. I safety though, yeah. I've given, to be honest, I think that's, uh, I think till we don't have more women occupying public space, I think again, this is where I go back to traditional economics, it's supply and demand. If there are more women out in public space, you will see changes, uh, that, that will happen. One more freedom I would like to add. I'm going to US on 23rd. My daughter, he, she has to take the approval of her husband. Ah, God. Yeah, there we go. That's it. There we go. Uh, yeah. And he is in Google. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, sir. No, sir. Way. This is yeah. and this is the thing. If you read, if you read the stories in the book. Very sad. Yeah. Ab, no, 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 yes. sir. Your the one thing I will say is, irrespective of class, these things hold. It doesn't matter. Google, Uber. You're absolutely right. It's a, it's a. Yeah. Yeah. Highly educated. Sorry. It's really sad, but that's the point. Hi. Um, what is your name? Sorry. My name is Balji. Hi, Balji. Whatever conversation we have had till now. Thank you. Thank you for helping. <laughs> Whatever <laughs> conversation yeah. we have had till now, uh, the solution part, we have understood the needs here and the disempowerment and the needs and where, where they're lacking or they're even trying to cope up with. What's the ultimate solution? The social structure, as you said, yeah. it is so emotionally draining, taxing, yeah. laboring. Even if you try to communicate with the men in whatever way, but again, it is really emotionally taxing to make the other person understand that we are not into fight. We don't yeah. know fight and flight mode, yeah. but we want to make things work. Yeah. And how is it that possible? I guess you have to interview 15 years men <laughs> finding them. No, I I spoke to men, uh, which will probably be for my something I'm doing. Uh, but I'll tell you a couple of things. Look, I think if you read the stories in the book, one thing you realize is when women start to stand up for their own needs, right? You articulate them, you articulate them clearly and you... You know, people, I hate that phrase, smash the patriarchy. Like, I don't think patriarchy can be smashed. I think it'll melt. It'll melt every day. Um, it's a small, everyday steps, right? You want to put your child in childcare and spend an extra hour at work, right? Something as simple. So I, I understand your frustration, but I really feel all of us are in this together. And I think through small, everyday steps, I really think you see in the story, the everyday little, little steps lead to really big changes, particularly in the stories in the book. There's a lot government can do. That's a whole separate conversation. I get into it in the book. I don't, I realize we don't have that much time and we can talk about it later. There's a lot, there's a lot government is doing as well. Um, some of it helpful and some of it not fully helpful. Um, but I think to me, more than government, I think we should look to each other and ourselves and Really, I think what I really want women, particularly women, to take away from the book is if you stand up for yourself, there's a lot. And by the way, standing up for yourself sometimes can mean being lonely. Yes, I, I stood up for myself and I had to deal with the loneliness and it's okay because I realized that that's the cost I pay in a society that will tax me for making my and own that's decisions. So unfortunate. It is unfortunate, but it's a fact. 
and you have to be ready for it and you have to be ready either way. Once you get together, then it's possible. Yes, yes, exactly. You're married. You are married. Okay, so when you look back in certain years, when you look back, you say, oh my God, I put up with so much of crap. You will think that. And then you say, okay, okay, it's, it's a price I'm paying for peace. But at some point at the stage, you will feel what she's saying is pertinent that you have to move on. Yes, yeah. I think that's the reason I'm here. Men, uh, go with stats and the stats cover this. I'm sorry, I think it's But I think men go with stats, right? Because this percentage and that percentage, probably they believe in more of this. At least if that comes to this generation, like this, uh, the generation Y, they think, they don't think uh, the women are like the younger people, they, they think that the women are privileged enough. Like, if I ask my son, he's like, why? My, my yeah, girl. that's, it's just shocking so, to me because the book, if you see, our current employment rate for women is lower than where we were in 1911. Huh? Wow. Yeah, yes. The New York Times, yes, the New York Times, The Economist, even if you think these are, you know, publications, mm. Indian journalists, right, from, you know, from Republic to Times now to see it to whatever, everyone has been reporting on what a massive crisis we have when it comes to women in the workforce. Yeah, and we don't um, realize and that. And we are, and I, I, one thing, in fact, what I wanted to do for the, in the book is the numbers are all there. There's a, there's like a 20 page data and extra at the back. But I really wanted people to understand what those numbers feel like because there's a story behind those statistics. Um, and I think just sharing the statistics, you know, it happened with yeah. COVID deaths, right? We all became so inured to them because it's just one number after, after the other. Yeah. I think the job of people who are trying to write or communicate a story is to tell you, well, you need to know the data well enough to tell a story, but you need to tell the story. Um, and I think behind this crisis of jobs, there is all this stuff, right, about what's happening with men and women, what's happening with love. All of that is finding its way into the economy because women are retreating, particularly elite women I followed, they are retreating from paid jobs, from their career ambitions because they feel that their in-laws, their families, they just won't let them be and do what they want to do. Um, and I think, yeah, so I hear you. That's a shout out though. I, that's I know, that's quite a... No, news. India is one of the only countries, a remarkable example, uh, while most countries grow as an economy, women tend to step out of the home much more. We've gone exact opposite. As we grew, our labor force participation rates dropped. In 2004, we were at 44 point something. In 2017, we were 23.3. Oh. We are, and it is not just, I mean, every economist, every publication has been talking about this. And the fact that I do see actually our finance minister, I do have to say our finance minister, our, our, our you know, WCD ministry, they take this crisis very seriously because it was a very serious crisis. But we don't, in fact, it's funny, I hear government talking about it, but I think the solution is not with government, it's with all of us. Yeah. We can't keep looking, yeah, we can't keep looking at just, oh, you know, that's not, you know, a finance minister can't come into all our homes and sort out whether yeah. the husband is helping in the kitchen, right? So I think uh, it's an interpersonal crisis, but we have a crisis. It's a very serious crisis. Yes, one, one last question based on this. You know, as the writer said, it's an interpersonal crisis. And it's about all the mental health and loneliness. So is the world bank doing something? <laughs> you're, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah. Are doing something to take care of these <sighs> yeah. problems? Because we are into the process of uh, setting up the telecommunication centers, telemedicine centers, throughout the rural part. Yes. Is World Bank doing something for funding such kind of projects? Yes. Projects? We have three projects uh, in different states. One is in Jharkhand, the West Bengal project that I mentioned. And there's another colleague of mine who's leading something in Tamil Nadu. It's trying to provide support to women, peer-to-peer -peer networks, mm -hmm. as well as counseling. Mm -hmm. So yeah, hopefully. Mm -hmm. so, but I, I still why, don't know. Why, why, why not my answer? Of course, the, you know how we work. Uh, I will go to Bombay <laughs> and uh, <laughs> hopefully, hopefully someone will ask us. If government asks us, we are very happy to help. But government, we have to always go through. But then you also support NGOs so, as well directly. No. So we can take this conversation yeah. as yes, a signing you. and probably we could have become Oh, nah, Shah Rukh Khan still, yeah. <laughs> right. Rather not look out for that. So uh, wonderful. Yeah. So uh, thank you so much. That was a conversation beyond the conversation, I would yeah. say, and very interestingly. And the figures and the data, what you have shared, the percentage is quite uh, shocking, and yeah. it's a news to me because you know I stay very close to the young generation, and these uh, this generation specifically, the the boys, the males. 
they they don't consider females and the girls as okay you yeah. can't do this you can't do this if i can do this you can also do this so they are coming from that mindset yeah. which is quite uh, you know good to see yeah. but comparing this with the percentage what you are seeing or uh, showing in the book or telling right yeah. now is quite shocking because there is a yeah. disconnect I, mean, i think the disconnect is we live in a bubble uh, we all of us by our own nature we live in a bubble and i think in the book there's vision correction because i think it is important for all of us to know what's yeah. happening yeah so wonderful we have Thank spoken you. too much about the book and everyone is curious to you know get the book signed by the author Thank before you. that i would really uh, would like to invite uh, uh, miss mohini berry from tradition blue to uh, give word of thanks hello everyone hi uh, it's a pleasure hosting the event for prabha ketan foundation and it's a pleasure being associated with them because of them we get a chance to host <coughs> such a brilliant authors in our hotel i hope you like the stay with them it was wonderful thank, thank you. you thank you very much i would like this morning to please present moment to our speaker this shreyana bhattacharya Thank you so much, Miss Mohini. Um, just a formal word of thanks. I thank Shri Cement Limited, our venue partners Radisson Blue, our media partners Lokmat, my fellow SRS women of Nagpur, Priyanka Kothari, Parveen Tuli, Monica Bhagwadar, Prabha Ketan Foundation definitely for sure, Miss Shreyana Bhattacharya for making this event a uh, very very interesting. and i'm sure no one is willing to leave the ground as of now not nearly you know 10 15 minutes so they will be here with you for an hour i guess and uh, to all the audience a big thank you to all of you to make this event super successful for all of us thank you so much and we will be uh, shreyana will be uh, signing the books for you all i would request you all to come one by one for the book signing for every a uh, member there is one book and for one family there is one book thank you so much